Good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Shuttleworth. I lead product design and development for Canonical, uh, and I'm the founder of the Ubuntu project. Um, we'll be talking a little bit today about different types of containers uh, and, <clears throat> and specifically the integration of native containers on bare metal with OpenStack. Uh, my colleague James Page. I'm James Page. I'm a technical architect in our OpenStack engineering team uh, and I've been working with uh, OpenStack on Ubuntu for probably as long as that existed so uh, hopefully I can talk authoritatively about most things. So. All right. So, <clears throat> what is a container? Uh, this isn't a container. This is a traditional physics, uh, physical Linux or Unix machine. Uh, and it has a couple of distinguishing characteristics. First, it has an IP address. So the red dot, that's an IP address. Second, it has its own disk, right? Any process running there talks to the disk, and all the processes running there, they, they feel like they're talking to the same disk. And then it has a set of operating system processes. You know, when you, when you install a fresh CentOS, when you install a fresh Ubuntu, and you turn it on and you say PSAX, you'll see some stuff, right? right? And that stuff is providing services to the applications that you're going to install. So, for example, syslog is running there. Apps can just send log information to syslog, and that will then do whatever it needs to do with it. Uh, init is running. Uh, cron, that will essentially generate uh, uh, trigger batch jobs to run at particular times. Um, if you just do PSAX on a fresh Linux system, you'll see a whole set of processes. And that's really the operating system, right? So we consider a machine to be uh, a construct that has, it's addressable, it has an IP address, uh, it has its own sort of disk space, it has all of these operating system processes providing operating system services effectively. Um, and I can install applications. I know how to install applications. I know how to keep that whole thing um, fresh. I can patch manage it. I can administer it. I can update it. Now this is, we've been doing this for 30 years, right? This is all standard stuff. And then along came some clever folks and said, well, let's recreate that. Let's slice up that machine by introducing, uh, sorry, so the red process there is the app, right? And system administrators know how to install that app, they know how to operate that and keep that whole thing secure. So clever people came along and said, well, let's slice up machines so we can get more machines without buying more hardware, and let's do that with virtual machines. And so what do we mean by a virtual machine? Well, again, it's a construct that looks and feels and operates just like a machine, which means it has an IP address. There it is. It has SSHD running there, right, if it's a Linux machine. Uh, it has cron and syslog and init and all of those background processes that you would expect. And the beauty of this, of course, was that nobody had to change any of their practices, procedures, or code, right? We could use virtual machines just like physical machines, right? And that's what made them powerful. That's what made them so useful. We could get them quickly. We could get them on demand. Uh, and we didn't have to change the app, we didn't have to change the operator to use virtual machines. And then along came Sun, and Sun said, you know, that's great, but what if we, uh, but there's quite a lot of overhead associated with that virtual machine, right? To make that virtual machine, we're actually emulating hardware, right? Which is very inefficient. What if we essentially just created a construct which felt exactly like that, but didn't have the hardware emulation layer, right? And so that was Solaris zones, and they were designed to essentially create a new Solaris box instantly, because what you were really doing is you were telling a lie to those processes that they were their own machine when in fact they were sitting on the same kernel on the same hardware as everybody else. So that was Solaris Zones, and IBM created a team to bring that idea to Linux at, at LTC in Portland. When IBM shut down that project, Canonical took on the responsibility of leading that project, and that is now the Linux containers projects, LexC and LexD. Uh, and the, the whole point of that kind of container 
is to give you a full machine experience, just like a virtual machine, but in a container. And so this is a kind of container that reproduces everything we know and are used to about operating machines, right? So this is a kind of container where all of those processes that you would expect when you boot up a machine, all of those processes are in that container. You've got syslog, you've got cron, you've got init, you've got a bunch of your, 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 your journals, all of the background processes that make up the operating system are there. That gives us the very nice property that we can operate software, install applications, upgrade applications, keep them secure, in that machine container exactly the same way as we do on a VM, right? So my existing applications, with that unmodified with my existing operator practices, good or bad, right, can now be containerized in this new kind of guest, right? Uh, and so that feels very familiar feels operationally comfortable, right? But it does bring quite a lot of the past with us, right? Those applications are typically unmodified, traditional Linux applications that are being installed there. Then along came Docker, and Docker, has, Docker said, hey, why don't we, if we're running lots and lots and lots of these applications, and if they are essentially stateless, then we don't need all of those operating system processes in every container, right? We just need uh, MySQL D. We don't need syslog because we're not sending logs locally, we're sending logs over the network, right? So the Docker innovation, which we call process containers, is essentially to shrink the envelope of the container down to just a single application process. So you'll see this when you use Docker, that one of the things, you, you specify a file system and then you specify a single command to run. And if you go into a Docker container and say, what processes are here? You will not see syslog, you'll not see SSHD, you'll not see um, cron, you'll not see um, the background processes of an operating system. You'll see the files, but you won't see the processes. So that has lots of interesting properties. It's a very useful new kind of way of thinking about software. But it does require that we operate differently because if you just put an app there that's expecting syslog, it's not going to find syslog, right? It does require that we think anew about how to operate that class of software. And that's why you see this, this fantastic explosion of innovation around Mesos, around Docker Data Center, around Kubernetes. These are essentially operating frameworks to replace all of those, all of the functions that those operating system processes used to provide for the application process. Does that make sense? Okay. So machine containers, LexD, and Docker containers, process containers, sit right next to each other. And in fact, you can run Docker inside machine containers. So Docker can sit on top of LexD quite comfortably. I can go into that machine container and run Docker there, and then I get a container within a container. Right? I get a process container inside a machine container. We'll look at that in a little bit. So OpenStack. What is OpenStack? Simplistically, OpenStack is a spreadsheet for keeping track of guests. Right? It, lets, it essentially lets me get VM sprawl under control. It lets me harness, it lets me keep track of which VMs or which guests, more appropriately, belong to who and what machine they're on and what IP addresses and disks and things are associated with them or what projects they're associated with. So OpenStack very comfortably sits underneath both KVM, as you know it today, right, where you have machines, virtual machines, and LexD, where you have container machines, because LexD container machines are designed to feel just like KVM guests, right? So the entire experience, you can understand, is, fits very naturally there, right? On the right-hand side, I've got the machine containers, LexD. I get bare metal performance and low latency, all the things people love about containers. On the right-hand side, I get the isolation and the ability to have a different guest OS. I can put Windows in the virtual machines, but I can only put Linux 
in the, in, the, in the container machines effectively. But all of that can be managed by OpenStack. And it's very important when you're using abstraction layers that you're abstracting the right thing, right? So OpenStack makes a lot of assumptions about guests, that you can SSH to them, for example, that they have consoles. That they, those are all true of LexD, right? But they're not true of Docker, right? So I can't SSH to a Docker instance because SSH isn't there, right? What's there is MySQL or the database process or Mongo or whatever I put in the Docker process, right? So I need a different operating framework for all those process containers, whether it's Docker, Docker or Runcy or Rocket or OSA, it doesn't matter. And so Kubernetes is the one we'll touch on this morning, right? But there are, there are a range of them, and it's an area of great innovation at the moment. Okay, so that's a picture. That's a picture of um, the, a bit of the history and also the semantic differences between these kinds of containers. Unfortunately, if we keep talking about containers, then we keep confusing ourselves, right? So it's, it's really good to talk about machine containers and process containers, because then it's clear what has been containerized, right? Uh, and also how you would expect to operate that, how you would expect to use that. Okay, this is a slightly different version of this picture. Um, bare metal at the bottom with a hypervisor. And so it could be VMware, it could be Hyper-V, it could be KVM. Uh, and guests on top of that, and remember those guests are machines. They feel just like machines. They have all the processes of machines. I administer them just like a machine. So LexD fits right next to that set because it too gives you guests, right? They're containers, bare metal, latency, zero latency, uh, uh, um, no vert effectively, but they are guests in every single sense. We run Docker or Rocket or OSID on top of the guests. You can also do that on top of bare metal, but we run them typically on top of the guests. And that gives us all of these processes. Each process has an IP address, and it can have some disks associated with it. But fundamentally, think of it as a process with an IP address, right? And we can, again, run Docker, Rocket, OSID on all of those guests. We can run Docker or Rocket or OSID inside LexD and on top of KVM, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so here's OpenStack managing guests. And here's Mesos or Docker Data Center or Kubernetes managing processes, right? Processes with IP addresses at the top, VMs or really machine constructs at the middle level, and then bare metal at the bottom. So this was a long way of just providing context for the different kinds of containers and why you might use OpenStack in one case, why it feels comfortable to use OpenStack in one case and why it doesn't in, 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 in the other cases. Now, our view is that this is exactly how people should think about operating Docker containers, right? It is a different layer, right? There are some folks who have a different view. OpenStack is a big community, a broad, a broad church, big tent. And so some folks say, oh, no, we need a custom set of APIs in OpenStack just to deal with those processes at the top. And so we have projects like Career and Magnum and all sorts of things that at the OpenStack layer are trying to, trying to bring those processes into OpenStack. Bluntly, I think that's crazy, right? Bluntly, I think those APIs will never be adopted because they only exist in an OpenStack universe. Our view is that what you want is you want the best of breed process container layers, which are Docker Data Center, Kubernetes, Mesos, and others, things you can use on the public cloud, right, and on bare metal, and you want those to be available to you on OpenStack. And in fact, they are. There's no problem. You can run all of those things on top of OpenStack, right? It's a different endpoint. It's a different API, but that actually works because typically, project by project, it's a different set of credentials and users typically, right? And so this is really how we think functionally it's all going to work, right? Where we want containers that look like machines, those will be integrated at the OpenStack layer. Where we want containers that look like processes, those will essentially be an application level construct, a level above. So that's how we'll talk about it today. James. Okay, thanks, Mark. So um, let's take a bit of time and, and dig into LexD itself. So LexD has been around probably two years or so in one form or another. And what it does is it provides a network addressable uh, RESTful API onto the underlying Linux container infrastructure on a single server. So like I said, it's network addressable. It's a nice, simple API. It's been built from the ground up to be easy to consume, easy to integrate, and, and very, very easy to use. So 
If you uh, install Ubuntu 16.04 and you get Lex deinstalled by default, uh, Lex deinstalled by default, and the Lex C commands talk directly to that API to uh, spin up um, containers, manage images, managing, manage the underlying network on the individual host, manage the storage. All those semantics that a hypervisor brings are represented in that Lex D API and are designed to be super, super easy to consume. LexD is designed to be really, really fast, so the, the time to spin up a container is seconds. So the, the, the time from saying uh, LexD launch to, to getting something you can log into um, is a matter of seconds, so it's designed to be super fast. And we're designed to be super secure as well. So all, all the processes in a, a LexD managed container are not running as root. So once you logged into the container, you, you have the normal sudo commands, you have root within the container, but all those processes are wrapped up in an unprivileged user on the host. So God forbid there was a breakout from the container, all you've got is a, a, an unprivileged user on the host. So we've, we've, we've put a lot of security wrap around the actual container itself to make sure that it is, it is very, very secure. And we've got some very hypervisor type features. So you can snapshot containers. So you can snapshot a container, do some work, roll it back, uh, that sort of thing. You can migrate containers between hosts, and you can do that online. So you can do a live migration from host A to host B, entirely using the LexD API to push containers around your infrastructure, to do maintenance, to distribute load. And all of these things give us a very hypervisor type experience to LexD. LexD is a hypervisor at the end of the day. So the, the key idea is that where you use KVM today, you can optionally just use LexD right next to it on the same machine if you want and create guests that are actually bare metal containers with all the same snapshotting and live migration type primitives that you would expect from KVM. And that allows us to, to genuinely lift and shift legacy applications from VMs to containers without changing the code, without changing the operational practices. And two stories for you. Uh, a typical bank CIO said to me, I've got 8,000 Linux applications, and 10% of them will get touched in the next 10 years. So 7,200 Linux applications running in Linux VMs today right, are trapped. They can't become Docker Kubernetes applications because I have to touch them to make them that, but I want to get them into containers. So of the 8,000, 7,200, right, can come straight into LexD today. Typically about 90 plus percent of applications make that transition instantly, right? So Box, uh, which is a Silicon Valley company providing storage, was using a lot of scientific Linux. Uh, and they did exactly this. They moved um, uh, almost their entire portfolio of workloads into LexD successfully in a week. So what you get when you make that transition, obviously you get much better performance, much better density, and much lower latency, essentially zero latency, if you literally just lift and shift your applications. You don't have to change the operating system. It'll be Ubuntu typically underneath, but it'll be CentOS inside, or Scientific Linux inside, or Debian. Another project we did with Intel was a supercomputing project, and they took 19, uh, 1990s Linux code that we couldn't see from a supercomputer and ran it in, unmodified inside LexD on Ubuntu on a 2015-era supercomputer. And they literally just copied the disks from the old supercomputer into LexD containers and ran those on the new supercomputer and everything worked completely unmodified, no problem at all. So it's a really sophisticated, it's, it's really sophisticated, but it makes things really operationally simple, okay? Okay, so let's talk about the integration then of LexD as a hypervisor with OpenStack, right? Okay, let's do a, a, a quick demo. So did everybody catch the interrupt session in the uh, keynote yesterday morning? Yeah, that wasn't a race, honestly. It was uh, all about interoperability of uh, 17 different clouds. So we're going to look at um, that same workload. Can we switch the video over to the second laptop, please? OK, so we've, we've got the same uh, LAMP stack deployed uh, on this orange box here. And let me just talk about the orange box to start off with. This is a 10-node uh, cloud in a box. And we've got OpenStack Newton deployed on here on Ubuntu 16.04. Um, it is running, I think we've got, let me check, 
seven hy uh, no, I can't add up, eight hypervisors in there. Uh, and they are a mix of KVM and LexD. So you can run both hypervisor technologies side by side in the same cloud, so you can consume both containers and KVM under the same API, ju just by um, selecting which hypervisor type you actually want to deploy your workload on. So uh, we've got three LexD, uh, five LexD hypervisors and three KVM in that, in that particular box there, and I'll talk about why we've got five and it's not equal in a minute. Um, but we've got the LAMP stack deployed, so HAProxy, MySQL, and WordPress. Um, and you can see here we've got um, four units of it. We've got WordPress, WordPress, we've got two units of that for a bit of scalability. So this is deployed on the, the KVM part of the cloud. So we'll, we'll have a quick look at um, what a instance looks like. And this will be pretty familiar with everybody. We can see processes running. We can see memory being consumed. We this can standard KVM guest with MySQL running in it, effectively. We can see there's a couple of cores being allocated to the instance, so OpenStack is applying constraints via libvirt and KVM into the underlying instance, and it only gets to consume those resources on, on, on the host. I've taken that same model, and I've deployed exactly the same thing on the LXD hypervisors in the cloud. So I've used exactly the same tooling, which is Juju here, and I've taken the same model and I put it down on both parts of the cloud in exactly the same way. All, so all we changed was the machine type that we asked for from OpenStack, right? So it's just a different um, instance type, effectively, see. from the same OpenStack cloud. So I can SSH to the machine, I can look at the process listing, which on a, on a Linux container is much, much smaller because you don't see all of the kernel processes in addition to the user space processes. So we can see in it, syslog, SSHD, uh, all, all the normal things you would expect on a machine, but with, without the, the process listing from the kernel as well. Um, we can so see... So just, a, just a, does that look familiar, right? That is just a Linux guest, but it's a container. Right, so everything you can imagine doing in a Linux guest that doesn't interact closely with the kernel, in other words, it's not loading kernel modules or anything like that, will just work in this container. And, and the applications in the container can see how much CPU they've got. They can see it's a two-core machine, and we can see that it's got exactly the same one gig memory allocation as the KVM instance had. So lift and shift, it entirely works. You can move the majority of your KVM workloads directly to LexD using exactly the same tooling as you're using against KVM today. You can do exactly the same thing with LexD. Okay. Yep, we can switch back now, please. Can we switch back to the other video, please? Can we switch video feeds, please? Thank you. So that's the, that is that OpenStack. That's that OpenStack deployed and modeled on that machine with, with Juju. You'll be, many of you will be familiar with using Juju to, to um, operate OpenStack. Um, and you can see that there are two hypervisors deployed effectively, Nova Compute and Nova LexD, um, which are these two boxes over here. OK. This is the underlying view. That is that physical box in MAS. So those are the physical nodes. And you can see they're just running the standard Ubuntu operating system, right? There's nothing fancy over there. And this is the horizon, I believe, for that OpenStack. So we can go in and have a look. Right, and here are those instances, and so you'll see both, they're, they're essentially all just instances inside the OpenStack, they show up in Horizon. Half of them are LexD instances, LexD guests, containers running at bare metal speed, and half of them are virtualized guests, KVM guests running at virtualized speeds. Um, and we should launch, launch some instances. We can, uh, can we just switch to the admin tab and look at the hypervisor overview? Uh, I think it's the hypervisors one, there we go. So th this view gives us the view of the hypervisors running in this cloud, and you can see that um, three of them are registering as QMU, and the other five are running as uh, uh, LexD. So we can uh, see via the, the web UI for OpenStack the, the different hypervisor types that we've got configured in this cloud. And you can see the current workload on each of those hypervisors as well, represented in exactly the same way between the two different hypervisors that we're running. So this is now standard best practice for us. We commonly deploy OpenStack with a mix of 
uh, KVM and LexD and then expose different instance types so that the users of that cloud can essentially choose when they're going to get a container uh, or, um, or when they're going to get a physical machine. Okay, um, before we move on to Kubernetes, I think we want to talk a little bit about how that, how that feels operationally. Okay, so operationally it feels exactly like using OpenStack, surprisingly. So all the things you do on your KVM cloud today, you can do with LexD as well. Boot, reboot, stop, delete, resize, rescue, fl add floating IPs. LexD integrates into the same underlying SDN technologies as a KVM instance does. So you can use VXLAN, GRE, whatever you want in terms of uh, your overlay networking or your, you know, d mapping things directly into the underlying provider networks in your data center. All of that just works. So it, from a tooling perspective, if you're using the OpenStack API to manage KVM now, you can use the OpenStack API to manage LexD now as well. And when I talk to people about what they want from containers, there's a, there's a very wide spectrum of, of opinions. But I'd say the, the first step, the bulk majority first step, is simply this. I want to be able to get better performance and density out of my OpenStack. Right? I want to be able to run the same stuff the same, same way, just with better performance and density. There are additional benefits to taking the next step to process containers. Right? Operationally, you get new primitives with Kubernetes or with Docker Data Center or with Mesos. But you have to think about them, and you want to essentially think about where you're going to get the benefit of that fastest and do it there, either in your next application or by going back and touching some of your existing applications. Um, a lot of the magic of LexD, a lot of the work that we do at Canonical on LexD, is providing operations safety guidelines, uh, 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 safety rails effectively around these containers. Because those processes are running on bare metal, plausibly they can consume all the resources of the machine. So things like um, precise allocation of quotas, number of cores, amount of RAM, amount of disk, IOPS, and so on, that's been a key, a key focus for the LexD team, right? They're really building a hypervisor, and hypervisors essentially provide bounds on the resource utilization. But the great story here is we have all the mechanisms of the Linux kernel to build on, right? We're allocating real CPU time, and so we can allocate, we can bound that and qu quas that in exactly the same way with, with decades of benefit of kernel quas capabilities, right? Anything you can do to a single process under Linux anywhere in the world in terms of quality of service, in terms of allocation of number of milliseconds of time of, uh, out of one second to a particular process or the biggest delay in terms of real-time response before a process gets time or in terms of the total amount of RAM or IOPS or, or, or CPU time that can go to a process. All of that can be applied cleanly and perfectly to LexD guests. So for example, people doing transcoding, real-time uh, applications, high-performance computing, really now have an incredibly precise hypervisor, a hypervisor that has properties unlike anything ESX or KVM can deliver. Um, and that means that LexD is really taking off in places where people really care about either control, like I want to control the amount of latency or jitter, or performance, right? I just want to get all the bare metal performance. Um, and the ultimate expression of that is essentially people saying, hey, this is a much better um, way to allocate a machine, a physical machine to somebody through OpenStack than Ironic, right? This is a way for me to essentially give somebody all of the compute of a machine or half the compute of a machine, but typically in some cases, all the compute of a machine without actually giving them the ability to flash the BIOS on the machine and without losing the um, hypervisor primitives such as the ability to attach storage and attach um, network interfaces to those instances. So here we've got live migration of LexD, uh, but the key story is the idea which is new in Newton as a contribution from us, is the ability to tell the scheduler that you only want to have a single guest, that a guest is going to be the only thing on a machine. So why is that interesting? If I give somebody an instance type in my OpenStack cloud, which is a LexD instance, 
and that is the only thing running on the machine, then I have effectively given them 100% of the CPU with no virtualization overhead, right? But I can still live migrate that to another machine. So there are a lot of hosting companies or uh, big data specialist companies or analytics or data science or machine learning type companies who find that this is the best way for them to essentially um, sell full physical machines by the hour, right, or the minute, while still preserving the ability to attach storage dynamically, attach these things to software-defined networks, and live migrate them in cases where they have to do physical ma maintenance on the machines. And then, of course, the other benefit is, is if those are untrusted users, th that container cannot flash the BIOS on the machine. It gets all the CPU, it gets all the RAM, it gets all the network, it gets all the, the disk capability, but it doesn't get access to the parts of the kernel that would let it flash the BIOS. From an op operational perspective, that's a really powerful story. And, and so if you think if you're doing this on bare metal, as a machine comes back from a cloud user, you have to cleanse it. You have to reflash the BIOS. You have to scrub out all the things that user may have done. And you have to deal with failures during provisioning, that sort of stuff as well with this. You put the server up, you put Nova XD on it, and that is permanently available as a fixture in your cloud for a tenant consume, to consume as a complete compute resource. Okay, so benchmarking. Okay, so um, let's have a look at um, how bare metal, LexD, Nova LexD and Nova KVM stack up. So I, I've completely stolen this data from one of my colleagues' presentation uh, on, on, on Tuesday um, about uh, big data and machine learning. So th this benchmark is uh, driven by Spark, and it does anomaly detection of credit card fraud. So it does uh, modeling and anomaly analysis to detect when, uh, say, someone goes to Spain from the US and buys a laptop or what it, whatever it might be. So we looked at that, and we looked at the time taken to complete uh, both the, the modeling and then the, the analysis of a data set. And the difference between bare metal and Novel XD running on an exclusive machine, so we're giving it the complete power of a single machine, was about 10%. And that difference, we think, is probably to do with networking. Um, the the, the Novel XD instance was connected to a virtual tenant network that was not using jumbo frames, and it's quite a data intensive process. We think with some further tuning, we can squeeze that even further. With KVM, the difference was, was considerable. It was almost twice as long on KVM as it was on, on bare metal. It's doing a lot of I.O., it's doing a lot of disk, it's doing a lot of networking, and it just took longer to do on KVM because of the overheads of that. Same again, same story with Terrasort, the uh, recognized benchmark for, for uh, your uh, Hadoop deployment. Again, about 10% difference between bare metal and LexD. Uh, a little bit further away with KVM here, you actually saw a, lot of, uh, a number of errors with parts of the Terrasort under KVM. Actually, I think this one is, this one is sub 2% and it's uh, because there's less networking here, right? So you're yeah. moving less traffic over the network yeah. with Terrasort. It's really focused on compute and disk um, access as your, as your bottlenecks and there's no overhead there effectively from, from LexD. So if we, if we look, at the, look at a different dimension, we're looking at latency here using Cassandra, which is lots and lots of very small writes from, from lots and lots of clients. Uh, on LexD, we saw a very low latency figure, 30 milliseconds, whereas on the same stack running on KVM, uh, that was uh, near 110 milliseconds average, average writes la latency. And that translates directly into throughput on your Cassandra cluster at the end day as well. So right. This is also super relevant for people doing um, time-sensitive transcoding or time-sensitive applications or high-performance computing where you need all of the nodes to effectively um, complete in a predictable amount of time so that you can move on to the next stage of your calculation. Okay, that's the, through, the, the, the counter throughput figure for the exactly the same test. So bigger buzz there or better. Okay. So OpenStack Newton has full integration of Nova with LexD. It's worth upgrading to Newton for exactly that feature. It's an amazing capability and it really changes um, the relationship that you have with your users. You know, they, they, they notice it immediately, right? It's an incredible shift in performance. Um, and, and the, the, the sort of the, react, the responsiveness of the cloud to them, right? We don't think we launched any instances, but they launch really, really fast. If, if we have time, we'll come back to that. Okay, so that's machine containers. They look, feel, operate just like machines. If your app is not fiddling with the kernel, it will go straight into LexD and never know the difference, right? For telcos, networking apps often do work in the kernel, but everything else typically 
doesn't really care what kernel it's on and doesn't have specific interactions with the kernel, right? It just needs a Linux kernel. Um, so Kubernetes. Now, Kubernetes is, is one of the three major ways to, to coordinate those process containers sitting at the top. And we want to talk just briefly about that. I will be doing a, an in-depth look at Kubernetes and at operating Kubernetes across public and private infrastructure, um, uh, virtualized and bare metal, uh, later on today, but just very, very briefly. So again, our view is that process containers are a completely different thing. Uh, they don't really belong in the infrastructure as a service, which is all virtual machines, virtual disks, virtual networks. They're essentially a layer on top. And you want to give work groups, teams, projects, the ability to get Kubernetes on demand for a project, to get the version of Kubernetes that they want on demand for a project. And so this is, um, this is upstream Kubernetes. This is, again, modeled and operated with Juju. Those charms, those Juju charms, are upstream in the Kubernetes repository on GitHub. And this, um, this model can be built trivially on any kind of machine-oriented substrate that you might have, VMware, bare metal, OpenStack, uh, or the various public clouds. MAS there is it's the physical cloud, effectively, so that's showing that I can build Kubernetes on bare metal. Um, and I think we have, let's go have a look. So on top of this cloud, so uh, on top of those clouds, we had a, a bunch of, uh, of instances. Um, and what that is that Kubernetes, right, modeled. I can show the instances here. These are now KVM. KVM instances on that OpenStack cloud. And on those KVM instances, we have built a model of Kubernetes. So here's the service model. This is the service view, effectively, the different applications. This is the machine view. This is looking from the bottom up and saying, what virtual machines do I have? Kubernetes is installed on those. And which, uh, which services, essentially, are in which containers? So, um, EasyRSA is a, is a key management service, effectively. It'll distribute keys between those various things. This um, um, deployment of Kubernetes is using, those are three virtual machines uh, providing etcd. Uh, there's Logstash and Kibana there for, for monitoring. Uh, I'll show you that in a second. Um, we've got a load balancing um, agent there, and then the Kubernetes worker and masters. Um, if I go and have a look, this is the Kubernetes dashboard. So here you see essentially the workload, workloads that have been deployed. Now, this, these are process containers and clusters of process containers that have been deployed onto that Kubernetes. So I used, so from the bottom up, MAS, modeling physical machines, Juju and Charms of OpenStack, modeling an OpenStack cloud on bare metal machines with LexD and KVM as hypervisors. Then again, Juju on top of the KVM guests modeling Kubernetes, and now Kubernetes modeling in process containers, Nginx, and various other um, services. If I wanted to do sort of management and monitoring on that, this is Kibana, which is fantastic. Kibana, top beat, file beat, an amazing sort of monitoring system. But I could, I could trivially integrate uh, Nagios or Munin or any other sort of monitoring framework into that Kubernetes. We just like Kibana, so here you can actually see what's going on inside those VMs uh, in Kibana. Okay. Um, just to show you what it feels like to operate Kubernetes here, say I said, okay, I, I want to have Nagios. So I could go and get Nagios and deploy that. And then I need an agent. I think I'm going to go with that one. And then I can just connect that agent to my Kubernetes machines and to ah, monitors. Ah, I'll need a different agent because I've got two different uh, series of Ubuntu there. But deploying that then essentially brings me, brings me Nagios into the model. And in time, essentially, I'll be able to see the same Kubernetes hosts through Grafana and Kibana and through, through, through Nagios. 
So that was a model built on OpenStack. Actually, that was on Amazon. This is, this is Kubernetes now, exactly the same model of Kubernetes, but built on Amazon, right? So you see the IP addresses up there. Um, this is Kubernetes on Amazon. You see it looks exactly the same. This is the same dashboard view with the same set of uh, Docker processes effectively uh, modeled in Kubernetes, but on Amazon. And this would be uh, Topi Kibana looking at the Amazon VMs providing that Kubernetes service. So you see how we've got exactly the same experience for Kubernetes on OpenStack on KVM and on AWS. And so we think that is a really powerful way to get access to the best of breed stuff from the public cloud for process containers, Mesos, Docker, Kubernetes in the OpenStack world. Right? Rather than uh, OpenStack specific APIs, which, only, which are only usable inside an OpenStack context, which are only useful in an OpenStack context, and which require to have operational tooling that's different for your OpenStack premise uh, environment versus your bare metal environment, your VMware environment, and your, and your public cloud operations tools. And now I'm going to go and finish that Magios integration. James, I think we have time for, do we have time? We're, no, we're out of time. But if you have questions, we'll be happy to take them afterwards. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you.